welcome. It's a pleasure to see you all here. My name is David Birdsell. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Affairs, and this is the third night of our fifth annual Public Affairs Week. It's already been a tremendous week. As you all know, we take all of the graduate students in the School of Public Affairs during this week, we suspend regular classes, and we reconvene those classes in here, hearing from some of the leading policymakers and the best thinkers about policy in this nation as those policies redound across the length and breadth of what we do, from a wide variety of disciplinary perspectives in what happens in schools and what happens in hospitals and what happens in government agencies and nonprofit organizations. And tonight, of course, we're going to be focused on schools and the issue of mayoral control. Um, I want you all to think not just about schools as you listen to tonight's distinguished speakers, but think about the issues of governance generally. Where do we seat responsibility for seeing after the people's interests? How do we best make sure that organizations established to sustain that interest do the jobs that they were slated to do? We're going to hear many perspectives on that this evening, and I very much look forward to this panel, and particularly a panel that will, t will show us that Public Affairs Week can get on without PowerPoint. It's an exciting thing and a wonderful development uh, for many of you who have seen too many of those presentations, uh, but I look forward to hearing from the panel. The honor of introducing that panel falls to Judith Kafka, Professor of Educational Administration here at the School of Public Affairs. Judith. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I am honored tonight to moderate this session. I'll begin by introducing Dr. Wilbur Rich, who will be our first speaker tonight. Um, Dr. Rich is a professor of political science at Wellesley College, where he teaches courses in American presidential politics, urban politics, public policy analysis, the politics of urban public schools, and the politics of minority groups in the United States. Dr. Rich received his Bachelor of Science degree from Tuskegee Institute, and he also received a Master's in Education and a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana. Before arriving at Wellesley College in 1991, he was on the faculty of Wayne State University, and he taught at Columbia University here in New York City as well. He was the 1989-90 winner of the Wayne State University Career Development Chair Award, and he was also awarded the New York chapter of the American Society for Public Administration Award for Outstanding Contribution to Furtherance of Professional Dialogue in Public Administration. That's a mouthful. Um, in 2000-2001, Dr. Rich was a visiting scholar at the Russell Sage Foundation. Dr. Rich's research focuses on minority participation in American government and on American public policy. He also writes about organization behavior, political communication, public school politics, and urban management. His book, Black Mayors and School Politics, The Failure of School Reform in Detroit, Gary, and Newark, was awarded the Outstanding Book of 1997 by the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. And he does not know this, but as a graduate student not too many years after, I found his book very informative and influential. So I'm very excited personally to have him here speaking tonight. Um, he has written and edited a host of books on topics ranging from Coleman Young, the mayor of Detroit, to the economics and politics of sports facilities. Most recently, Dr. Rich published a book entitled David Denkins and New York Politics, Race, Images, and the Media, which was just published in 2006, and he edited a collection of essays entitled African American Perspectives on the Political Science Discipline in 2007. He has published numerous journal articles, book chapters, and other books. Um, I have a whole list of other places that he has served, but I think at this point I'm just going to turn the presentation over to him because he has so many interesting things to share with us on the topic tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here, and uh, I know a few people here, uh, Lynn Weicker, and I just saw an old friend, uh, Steve uh, Savage, and uh, of course, uh, uh, I'm leaving somebody out, Dorothy Ships, who is a colleague of mine, and uh, so I'm very happy to speak. The title of my presentation is Why Reforming Urban Schools is So Difficult. Uh, a demand for um, school performance for minority children, uh, at least improves school performance in public schools, has stirred an incredible debate in America. Uh, 
among the issues of that debate is what, to, what is the best strategy for um, making schools more effective? And the second is who will lead the reform and what will it cost and who will benefit? The first question is a procedural one. Uh, the second one is a structural one. The third is a financial one. And the fourth is a societal one. There is no reliable answer to the first question, although there are no lack of super uh, volunteers who want to lead the system, so to speak. However, there's a lot of disagreement about costs, and the reason for that is that uh, different people have different views about which level of government should incur all the financial burden of reforming the school system. Surprisingly, however, uh, the cost estimates has played only a small role in the debate about how to improve school performance. Uh, I think that basically I'm very happy that most of the debate has focused on the welfare of the children rather than uh, uh, just how much it's going to cost to actually do this. Tonight, I'm going to discuss the various interest groups or stakeholders who are involved in inner city school reform, as well as how they react to change. St stakeholders are those groups who have direct interest in policy decisions. In school politics, the stakeholders are parents, teachers, school administrators, teachers, uh, union uh, officials, teachers, educators, and uh, people who sell uh, teaching material, uh, teaching material vendors. During the cor uh, current crisis, stakeholders have attempted to make the case before the public and to and uh, uh, lawmakers about what should be done. Um, I believe that we are in a, an era of, in which the, poly, uh, the wind of opportunity is open for uh, school reform. And increasingly, mayors have entered this tunnel uh, of school politics. And because the mayor is the most visible uh, politician in the city, uh, the mayor's involvement has not only intensified uh, media coverage of school politics, but it's also changed the way school politics is conducted. Um, and when I, in an earlier book I called Black Mayors and School Politics, I suggested a coalition of school activists, who I call the public school cartel, worked as a veto player in school reform. This coalition is, includes professional school administrators, powerful board members, union leaders, school activists. These people work together to prevent changes in the way schools are run. Uh, they have an enormous amount of influence uh, in policy. Uh, uh, they are very active. They're, they're very, uh, not just when there's a school crisis, but they stay active in, in urban politics, sometimes uh, contributing to uh, fundraisers, uh, for the mayor and for the council members and so forth. Now, the, the cities I've looked at uh, in my career, um, St. Louis, Detroit, I spent a lot of time in Detroit, uh, uh, Cleveland, Memphis, uh, and, uh, and, and New York, and also uh, Boston. Now, uh, I, I'm not saying that the public school cartel can dominate the political process because obviously the federal government can preempt a local board and this has happened with No Child Left Behind. But I would say that the public school cartel is especially effective at the local level. Um, and it's not uncommon, and especially in places like Detroit, for the public school cartel to engage in very tough political tactics to keep policy encroachers from entering the, uh, the domain of school policy. And uh, I've seen what they've done to uh, Detroit mayors and the Cleveland mayors, and I know that they're very effective, and also members of the city council. I also see what they're doing to uh, Michelle Ree in Washington, D.C., which is very interesting. I hope somebody will write that up. Um, in a labor-friendly uh, state, like uh, Michigan, uh, the cartel will use the contract process to dictate the workplace conditions for, for teachers and administrators. Uh, they are very heavily involved 
in uh, the recruitment of superintendents. They prefer an out-of-town person. Um, since the superintendent is not a member of the cartel, they make very easy scapegoats in a crisis. So it, to, it, in a sense then, um, they prefer someone who's not connected in the city. And of course, uh, superintendents understand that and they come to a city and they work for about three or four years and maybe five years at the max and then they leave and go someplace else. Um, one of the reasons it's very difficult to manage or to combat or to interact with the, the cartel is that they, they don't have a real centralized leadership. It's not a conspiracy so much, it's a mindset. Uh, these people are quite aware when their interest is being threatened and they react by uh, making sure that nothing really changes in the way the schools are run. So, so the power of the, uh, the public school cartel emanates from its ability to mobilize its members when threat is perceived. In many cities, um, and I, 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 I've seen this process in a lot of cities, um, they, 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 they try to characterize uh, the mayor or anyone else who, in city government who try to, uh, tries to get involved in school politics as power grabbers. Uh, they also, in St. Louis, uh, one of the taxes they used was to say that there was a conspiracy by the Republican Party to divide the black community so that they could take over the school system. Um, so in a sense then, uh, ordinary citizens not uh, ignored because they are mobilized at times and uh, in St. Louis for example they were uh, uh, mobilized by the teachers unions and they marched on uh, on the state legislature. So and it, one of the problems with uh, um, with this uh, cartel is that the way it behaves toward its own members meaning the teachers uh, in the school system. One is that they, they don't tolerate a lot of uh, dissent on the part of teachers, um, and they uh, because they believe that dissent really invites unwanted attention and interlopers, meaning people who will come in and, and try to change the nature of the school system. So basically, one of the things that I tried to say in, in the several things I've written is that the cartel wins most of its va battles by simply waiting out the tenure of its political opponents. So, so in, in a sense then, um, one, of the, one of the problems is that the cartel has support in the, uh, in the state houses of, of, of the United States. Um, uh, one of the things I, I observed in, in Cleveland was that uh, uh, basically there had been a sort of tactical agreement between the State Department of Education and the Cleveland uh, School Board. Uh, basically, uh, in exchange for their silence about the fact that the schools were not being integrated, uh, they allowed uh, a whole lot of things to go on in this, in this Cleveland school system, which were uh, really bad in the sense that they had a lot of deficits. Um, so basically, the tactical agreement is we will not uh, take over your system as long as you uh, keep at least uh, some sort of fiscal responsibility. Now, uh, so actually when, when there's a massive amount of fiscal irresponsibility and mismanagement, this is what happens when, when, when uh, you have a takeover of the school system. Uh, that has happened, of course, in several occasions, and it did happen in, in Cleveland. Uh, uh, the, the mayor took over in Boston, but he took over in a, with the consent of a variety of people, and the mayor's ship in Boston is very different from, from say, New York or Chicago. Um, what happens when, when the school is taken over? Well, one of the things that the cartel tries to do is to uh, have a, a, a low profile. Uh, they don't go one-on-one -on -one with the takeover people. And uh, when this was happening in uh, St. Louis, the people were calling me on the telephone, asking me what they should do. And I said, well, you do what you usually do, do nothing. And of course, uh, uh, and uh, they, they did in fact take over the school system. Um, 
So what, the reason that they keep a very low profile is that uh, they know that this is just a temporary thing, that the state can't permanently keep the school system. Uh, they can't take the political heat, and they don't really want to run uh, the St. Louis school system, at least this thinking goes. So what happens is um, they wait until the state makes a mistake, or they wait until the, uh, the uh, scores come out, and you see that the state took, take over the school system hasn't improved the scores of, of the students and so forth. So they make a big thing out of that. So what happens is, uh, as it did in, in Detroit, they established a kind of working relationship with the appointed boards. Usually in these takeovers, uh, the state legislature gives the mayor the authority to appoint the CEO as well as the board. And uh, usually what happens, and this is fascinating, uh, it happened in Detroit, is that the mayor is more inclined toward appointing people who are professionals, uh, people who are like physicians, lawyers, people from the corporate world, and they are always resisted. In Detroit, uh, they, they, they uh, were uh, you know, subject to a lot of abuse, verbal abuse from the, uh, from the public. Anyway, uh, Detroit has gone back to the elected board, and of course, they elected uh, people who were not corporate types, not lawyers, and so forth. So what happens is uh, the central board is part of the cartel, and they, they always keep a very low profile. And they are in a, what, what I call a survival mode. Uh, they, they, they know that the new takeover people are going to introduce a whole lot of new things like new words, new management jargon, uh, new strategies, all that stuff, and they just relax because it's not going to really stay. And they also know uh, that uh, that the contract, the service, uh, the union contract, is sacrosanct. That, in the sense that, sacrosanct is in the sense that uh, they can uh, go to court if uh, if the new superintendent attempts to change uh, the way the schools are run uh, and the way teachers are protected. So uh, in a way, then, I, I'm, uh, I'm suggesting that uh, in order to, for the cartel to remain a veto player in, in school policy, doing what I call the troubled times, um, the, the supporters cannot be uh, seen publicly or have the image of just against all change. And uh, one of the things that I, when I went to uh, St. Louis, uh, they, uh, the union said, well, we, we're not against all changes. Professor, we, uh, we just have our own changes that we like to make. For example, we'd like to have smaller classrooms. We'd like to have more money for teacher development and a variety of other things, and none of which uh, they, they, they got. But they didn't, they didn't like not have a plan uh, to go one-on-one -on -one with the, with the, uh, with the uh, takeover people. But all, everybody, given the fact the public has a very short attention span for school issues, the troubled times will pass. And uh, so in a sense, then, the public school cartel can assume the kind of holding pattern and wait for their opponents to uh, lose interest. And this is precisely what happened in a lot of school systems I've looked at. Uh, uh, what happens is that uh, people lose interest in the school system. I, uh, my own city of Boston, uh, uh, for 10 years, we had the same superintendent, uh, Paysant, and uh, everybody was very happy with Paysant because nothing was happening. Uh, there was uh, no d demonstrations, no complaints, and no progress. Uh, but he was a good superintendent, in quotes. Um, so in a sense, then, you know, it's the future of public schools are really at stake, and there's a tremendous uh, competition to, for, of ideas in the, in the process of school reform. You have the conservative Republican types who are suggesting things like vouchers, uh, school choice, uh, a variety of other kinds of things to shake up the monopoly that public schools have. Um, there's also, on the liberal side, the, uh, you have the interest in trying to uh, you know, raise teachers' salaries, uh, 
you know, uh, have smaller classes uh, and uh, have more uh, safety in the school system itself. But what is really happening is that America has resegregated itself. And uh, it's probably more segregated now than it was Brown versus Board of Education 1954. Many of you weren't born then. But uh, uh, as a result, uh, America has basically made it a, a policy decision uh, not to uh, promote the idea of integrated schools. So as a result, a lot of the attention that's being given to schools today is how do we can educate African Americans and Latinos in the schools where they are. And I don't know whether that's possible uh, because there's no way in which uh, uh, you can literally support a dual school system. This was a thinking uh, in 1954, and it's still true. Um, so what we have then is a struggle uh, amongst uh, these groups. And one thing I like to say is that the reason that the cartel is so successful in blocking and vetoing things is that they are underestimated by policymakers. Uh, these individuals, uh, uh, many of whom are first generation minority uh, uh, teachers, college graduates, uh, they are very, this, the unions represent the first type of real political organization they ever served in. And, and, and they know all the teachers. They either know them through, as we discovered in Baltimore, we, they either know them through their fraternity organizations, sometimes they go to the same church. Uh, you know, it, that's, that's an enormous amount of uh, interaction between teachers. So it's very difficult to impose change on a bunch of people who really are resistant to change. And these people are much smarter than I, than I, than I think some of the legislators think they are. Um, finally, uh, they, I'm, not, I'm not trying to create a, an iron cage so you can't get out of this. I'm suggesting that... Um, uh, uh, you, uh, I'm suggesting that uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Clarence Stone, wrote a book called uh, The Politics of Reforming Urban Schools. And he talks about this notion of, of, uh, of uh, civic capacity. And what he's basically saying in this notion is that if the community, if the uh, community, the uh, corporations, and everybody work together and have sort of a mobilization, you can basically overcome the the, the, the stranglehold of the system that the uh, public school cartel now enjoy. Uh, I hope he's right. I'm not so sure he is, but I hope he's right. I've never seen this work, and uh, we've been arguing it for the last 15 years now, and, uh, and he finally told me, I, uh, Wilbur, I found a place where it works. I said, where? He said, El Paso, Texas. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It is my pleasure to now introduce Mayor Cory Booker, and he has asked me to say barely anything about him in the interest of having more time for questions. So I will just mention that he was elected mayor of Newark, New Jersey in 2006, becoming just the third person to govern that city since 1970. Um, I'll skip all the various magazines that he's been in and on the cover on, all the lists he's been in. Um, he received his BA in political science from Stanford University in 1991 and an MA in sociology the following year. He was also a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, um, and he received a law degree from Yale Law School in 1997. And I guess he's cutting me off, so um, here he is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my senior advisor, Barry Mattis, is here. She looks like a Mazda Miata, but really she's a Mack truck, and she will hit me if we don't get out of here on time because I have a plane to catch, and I want to dive in and be as short as possible because I think really where we're going to have a good dialogue is mixing it up with some questions and talking. First of all, the gentleman uh, to my right is uh, really a beacon of light to me. Some of his early publications uh, helped ground uh, a lot of my passions and a better understanding of what I was up for in uh, my efforts in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and a tremendous, if you have not read his works, uh, really calls it like it is and the challenges. So let me just be candid and not so polished and, uh, and a little reckless and provocative if I can. Um, but uh, stuff is screwed up. 
okay? And we have, we have uh, serious problems uh, that threaten the very uh, uh, nature of our nation. They threaten our country. The biggest singular, uh, in my opinion, the biggest singular national security risk we have is not thousands of miles away on a foreign land. It's a threat to democracy we have going on right here in the United States of America. Uh, and I think it's in our inability to educate our children um, at equal and high levels. It's the inability uh, of us as a nation uh, to deal with concentrations of poverty, uh, the fact that we are still a country that is uh, divided too much against itself along lines of race, along lines of color, uh, along lines of socioeconomic status. So we have a real challenge. And the only, it's almost like a chorus of hope goes out every morning. Uh, of aspiration when children, whether they are in Newark, New Jersey, or Summit, New Jersey, uh, and they all stand up and they say the same thing. They say that we're the United States of America, we're one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, but I'm telling you right now, there's nothing about this country, and Frederick Douglass says, in life you don't get everything you pay for, but you're gonna have to pay for everything that you get. And those people who think we can hope our country better or uh, uh, just to pray our country better, uh, they're dead wrong. It takes fighting. And when you're fighting for change, it is the most difficult, uh, often uh, messy, complicated. Uh, you have to be willing to stand up and have yourself called every name in the book. Uh, I've been called a KKK member. Uh, I've been called a tool of the Jews, which makes me think I'm bringing people together, dear God. Um, uh, uh, um, I, I, I've, you know, I've had windows on my car smashed, tires slashed. Uh, even just today, I've got the teachers union in the city of Newark taking out massive billboards uh, in, in our city uh, that are meant to attack me on an individual basis. Uh, I have seen now, uh, in the last 12 years that I've been involved in the political world, when I was finally ready to raise a flag and say things are screwed up uh, and I'm not stopping until we do something about it, uh, that I've seen in the last 12 years, the, the unbelievable resistance to any kind of change, to deal with things that every single American agrees are screwed up. And every single American agrees that they fly in the face of logic, of justice, of truth, of liberty, of everything we stand about. So I'm just a guy that is very reckless. And my staff tells me that every single day. People say that we have too much crime in Newark. Nobody should live in fear in America. Nobody should live where they worry about their kids walking to school. The number one issue in Newark for a public school system uh, when I was doing polling running for mayor was not the quality of the education they get in the schools, which in my opinion I have serious issues with. It was the safety of their children going to school. And so I'm not going to settle in my life for incremental change. I'm not going to have the same discussions about black folk, about American folk that my father had two generations or a generation ago. It, it sickens me to think that my dad, when he was growing up, around the time of Brown versus Board of Education, and was describing the challenges of black folk, of poor folk, of American folk, uh, that now I'm going to have the same conversations in my generation, but frankly, they're worse. My dad, who was born to a single parent uh, in the mountains of North Carolina, in a viciously segregated, uh, uh, in a viciously segregated community, uh, where he was po, not poor. He couldn't afford the other two letters. He was just po. <laughs> um, uh, who comes up now, when I was living in some high-rise projects in Newark, and looks at the same child growing up in the same conditions, just as segregated, uh, just as Poe, uh, to a single mother. He, here this my father, the most optimistic man I know, to wax on and concerned about what is going on in uh, our cities and can this be the first generation of African Americans that does worse uh, than their parents' generation. So I'm a fighter and, and I'm, I've taken on some tough battles and stormed into places and break, broke some dishes and said some things that were messed up. And even to this now, I, I'm challenging people's conceptions of what's possible and challenging people to do radically different things uh, that throw a lot of people into uh, anger and frustration and a tizzy uh, with, with violent crime. Last year, people wanted to tell me that, th that things were getting better in Newark. And I said, how can you be satisfied with a 22% uh, reduction in shooting when we still have 400 people being shot in the city of Newark? So this year, I'm spending my time out in the middle of the night three, four o'clock in the morning, running around the city, yelling at anybody. If I see a kid on the street, I'm picking them up, scolding them, taking them home to their mama, scolding the mama, and, and saying, that, that what, what's, go, what's going on here? So, so we've got to do something. So education reform, I'm sorry. I used to be, when, when you took the poll, the conservatives versus the liberals, I think it's all getting mixed up these days, but I used to be one of those people who just said, well, if we just... Uh, and it's lowered class size, we'd be okay, and if we just, and then I have parents coming into my, into my office as a councilman and hearing the things that they were saying to me. 
that I couldn't understand that this was my country. Parents who used fake addresses to go to schools just hundreds of yards from where they live, but they're in a different town, these invisible political boundaries, using fake addresses to go to schools uh, that are so close to them, spitting distance from them. And those schools have groups, organized groups, that follow around children, minority children, to see where they go home. Uh, and they see that they go home across that invisible line into Newark, New Jersey, and they remove them from their schools and send them back uh, and then charge them tuition for the time that they spent in the succeeding public school. It's amazing what's happening. In Texas, I heard about a case where a, a family was being a, 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 a tried, put on trial by our justice system because they used a fake address to get their child to another school. Or I, I, parents come to me with tears in their eyes. They shut off their phones. They shut off cable. They did everything imaginable to get one kid in a private school. But yet now their second child is coming on and they can't afford it and they're devastated because they show me in the magazine, in the, in the newspaper, the success rates and the failure rates more likely. That, that a large percentage, 80 to 90 percent of the kids going to the school are, are failing minimum competency tests. And then in the city of Newark, we have the majority of our kids that are, that are graduating, that are technically graduating. The majority of our kids are, are graduating but can't pass eighth grade standardized tests. They can't pass the, what we call in, in, in New Jersey the HESPA test. So they have this thing where they get together and they have a little conversation. And they create another process, a substantial review and assessment, where people come together and say, oh, was this person uh, qualified to graduate? So then they graduate, and I have the head of the Essex County College tell me, I get these people to come here, the so-called college gra high school graduates, that aren't prepared to do basic work and need remedial education classes just to be able to compete uh, at, at the local county college. We have absurdities going on, and I read in the New York Times that a, a black child that does not graduate from, a black boy that does not graduate from high school is more of a chance uh, of being in jail than they do a full-time job. So I'm sorry. I, I, I'm tired. I'm frustrated. Violent crime, I, I, I've been able to shake things up, break dishes, yell at people, lose my temper. But right now in Newark, New Jersey, we've got almost a 70% reduction in murders now, almost a 50% reduction in shootings, and we're on our way to radical change because that's what's necessary. And in public education, I will not stop. I will fight. I will not compromise. Every single one of my children is born in a reflection of God and the divine and was born to manifest the glory of God in this world. And we are wasting our greatest human potential right now, every single day, we're wasting our greatest natural resource in the United States of America because we're failing to empower them. So I'm one of those mayors. I want control. I want the power. I want people to hold me responsible and hold me accountable for what's going on. And I'm sorry. You can't run school systems by committee. It doesn't work. You can't do the courageous things that need to be done within public education if you're trying to run them by committee. And these two, council, these two uh, people were elected by some of the stakeholders that, uh, 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 that my brother here talks about. These two are controlled by a certain political boss. And what happens? What happens is in 1995, what was happening in Newark, New Jersey? Accusations of selling principalships, school board members uh, taking fancy trips, being driven around in limos, going down to Hawaii, hanging out for conferences. And meanwhile, none of the incredibly high per pupil expenditure in Newark, New Jersey, upwards of $20,000 per child not going to the classroom. I talked to a financier, one of the most famous financiers, just the other night. He said, Corey, $20,000. I did an analysis of the books when I went to Westside High School, and I did an analysis of the book. Maybe $5,000 was reaching the classroom. There are so many absurdities, so many things that need to be, excuse me, that need to be shaken up and rearranged and put the children at the center of the equation. But I understand, I'm a Democrat, and I've been accused of being a right-wing Republican because of some of my views, because I believe that we should fundamentally change paradigms. How can we be in a paradigm that simply says that in public education, time will be the constant and achievement will be the variable? Kids will go to school the same amount of time every single day, same amount of hours, same amount of minutes. And by the way, as a teacher, my union says I have to leave at six minutes after this time and have to arrive only at this time. Meanwhile, other schools, charter schools, some of them in my city have said, no way. Achievement is going to be the constant, and time will be the variable. If my kids have to stay longer, they're going to stay longer. If my, if my kids have to stay stronger a week, we're going to have Saturday school. We're going to go to school an entire new month. Every child will learn, every poor child, every black child, every Latino child, every white child, every Jewish child, I don't care, is born with a genius inside of them, and we're going to unlock that genius and unleash it on the world. So we have a comeuppance right now in America. And unless we are willing to say the truth, and take on some of these entrenched interests that are so entrenched. Four years ago, I was on the platform committee for the Democratic Party. I'm standing in line uh, uh, to make an am amendment, and it was about education. I couldn't believe that the, the language in the Democratic Party's platform, which to me was anti-charter and anti-choice. So I knew I didn't have a shot in hell of getting it changed. 
But I went up there, and I'm on the platform committee, and there's this young lady behind me, and I'm a single guy, so I decided to turn around and flirt. And, <laughs> and, and I'm talking to this young lady, and I say, are you, are, are you on the platform? No, I'm not. I said, well, what are you here? He said, well, we're here to staff our delegates. Staff your delegates? I'm just a solo guy up down here from Jersey. What do you mean, staff your delegates? And she said, oh, we're from the National Teachers Union. We're staffing all of our delegates down here. I could not believe how organized they were against change, against the consideration to open up and look at new choices. So my point is, I'm dying to get into a conversation. I'm very passionate. Do I have all the answers? No. Was I a professional crime fighter before I got into the city of Newark? No. As they accused some other presidential candidates or politicians, rather, I just had words. But words were something very important to me. And we as a nation are founded in a way that has ideals that are worthy of fighting for. And given the control and given the power, I told voters very simply, either we change this or you get somebody different. And that's what we should be doing on education, centralizing power under the authority of a mayor who's held ultimately responsible by the people. I got elected with how many votes? 38, 30, 40,000, whatever. School board members in the city of Newark get elected with 2,000 votes, 3,000 votes on elections where nobody shows up. It's time that we are accountable to each other. We're accountable to our dreams. We're accountable to who we claim to be as a nation, and we are not there yet. Thank you. Thank you both very much. I know that there are lots of students and audience members who have questions. We do have people who will be circulating with microphones. Question in the back. Um, good evening. My name is Ibrahim Abdul-Mateen. I'm a National Urban Fellow here at Baruch. Um, my question is about the ideological swing that you were speaking about earlier, um, particularly with the um, sort of the conservative agenda that talks about choice. And then on the other side, it seems like it's just about raising pay. What's the middle way? You want to go and then I'll go ahead. Uh, uh, <laughs> go ahead, Doc. <laughs> what? Uh, As a politician, I have to protect uh, my. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> that... uh, I, I think uh, uh, you know there there are uh, there's something to be said. I mean, there's always an element of truth uh, in both ideological posi uh, positions. I mean, I think the conservatives have something to say, and I think the liberals have something to say. Uh, but I uh, trying to get them to agree is very difficult because they have different. Uh, 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 shall we say, uh, they have different objectives. I, I've, uh, one of the things I've, I've learned after going through all of these cities is that the conservatives really want to break the hole that the unions have on the teachers, okay? Because they don't think that's a good idea. Whereas the, the, the liberals think that the real problem is that the kids come to class with so little uh, preparation and something should be done to improve their school readiness, and maybe the schools could perform better. Uh, so it, it, so there's a, they, they're walking in two different directions, but they both have something to say. I do think that charter schools and vouchers should be used if they can shake up the politics of the, of the district. But I, I don't know if they're the real solution or the final solution to the school problem. Uh, but I do think they should be used. I, I've supported that. But a lot of other people think that vouchers is the end of public schools as we know them. And they're going to fight them like they did in St. Louis. And they lost in St. Louis. So, uh, you know, look, right, left, I'm, t I'm tired. I'm really fatigued by the whole uh, uh, shallow paradigm or, or the shallow uh, 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 different poles that we're talking about or the, or the spectrum. Look, I'm, I, let's just declare I'm a radical centrist. And, uh, and, and what works for me works. And what works for uh, the, the pragmatism works. Uh, so for example, you know, uh, these debates that I think are often so uh, uh, divisive and so much about uh, distracting us from what the real problems are. So I sit back and I look at affirmative action debate and people go on and on and I'm like, what are you, what are you really talking about here? The military is probably one of the best affirmative action organizations there are and we're not compromising national security. There's a way to make things work and there's a way to empower our communities that reflect our values. So to me, I think there's uh, a, 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 a something going on that's really exciting in the country and I, I think the, the professor said it, it's a challenge of shaking things up. So I'm part of an organization called the Black Alliance for Educational Options. And we believe sort of in Michael Mech's style of education, which is by any means necessary, uh, uh, whatever it takes, what's going to work. 
And when we first met, because we're not afraid of the V word, we're not afraid of the charter school word, we're not afraid of the magnet school word, we're not afraid of the home school word, whatever's working for people is what we should be embracing. And when we first met years ago, I think there was like four, we had a meeting for black Democrats that are part of this organization, Bayo, and we, it was just like two of us. We were, you know, uh, uh, sitting there, hanging out, uh, uh, drinking some coffee. Now we have a meeting with black Democrats uh, uh, for Bayo, and it, we, we fill a room this large. Uh, so something's exciting happening, and we're flipping things on its head. And I don't think that in any way uh, any sort of conservative analysis that says vouchers is the solution, they're wrong and they're fooling folks. Or that charter schools is the solution, they're wrong and they're fooling folks. Uh, but we've got to have a solution uh, that is much more comprehensive and much more understanding and it always puts the parent uh, at the center of the solution. And frankly, always puts the educator at the center of the solution as well, uh, the person that's on the front lines trying to teach uh, teach folks every day. But it's, if we're still stuck in talking right, left, conservative, we're really going to never solve this problem. If we start looking at what is working right now, find an island of excellence. Look at a KIPP school in Newark, New Jersey, the highest performing KIPP school in America that has the kids that go there that have the same demographic background. Uh, in fact, the charter school I sit on the board of that has all the kids going to college, when we first started, the kids were coming in three grade levels behind the district average. What's going on in that school that's working, that's showing such incredible results, and what can we learn from that that can affect the entire system? I don't care what the, let, what the uh, philosophical category is going to fall in, but let's just pursue it with vigor and insistence. How do you make mayoral control consistent from mayor to mayor? Sometimes uh, I, I, one is, uh, would think it, uh, something will happen once Mayor Daley leaves Chicago uh, because it's, it, it shouldn't be a personality thing. It should be structural changes. Uh, the next mayor will, should inherit a good working system, I would suppose. But I don't know what's going to happen in Boston schools when Mayor Menino decides to leave uh, because uh, I'm not so sure what's going to happen now that Payson has retired. So what, I, what I'm saying is I don't think that the way you, you uh, make things consistent is rely on personalities. You have to have structures, and these structures should be protected by some kind of law or some kind of rules and regulations. Otherwise, if, the, if, if, uh, if your good mayor decides to run for the governor or he decides to run for the presidency, then you, you lose decides, too much. Decides to run for cover. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, look, I mean, that's a, it's a big issue. There's one of my favorite books uh, called Built to Last. It's actually written, uh, they, they went on to write a book called Good to Great, the authors, and uh, it talks about the difference between a time teller and a clock builder in analysis of great organizations. And uh, the great organizations have clock builders, and the, the moderate or average organizations have time tellers, people that can stand up and look at the stars and interpret for the people what time it is. And everybody can then work in accordance to uh, the news. But the great leaders are the ones that are clock builders, that build mechanisms and systems uh, that even after they leave, people can still use and rely on those mechanisms and systems to tell time. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do as mayor of the city of Newark, is make radical changes inside, passing ethics legislation, uh, creating systems of accountability so that whoever becomes mayor afterwards can get it done. But at the end of the day, we get the government we deserve. And we have to have more activist involved uh, 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 electorate and citizenry um, that will make sure and ensure that we elect people that will, per that will perpetuate uh, the kind of reforms that reflect our values. And it's a challenge, but that's what democracy is all about. The I think it's bad when you have these diffused school, school boards where you don't have a high level of uh, democratic participation, where you don't have a high level of accountability. Uh, often you have people operating uh, a few steps removed from uh, residents, that that's when things become even worse uh, because there is no uh, strong levels of accountabilities at the top. So at least the mayors are far more visible, uh, far more understandable when they articulate what their educational visions are. And I'm um, hoping in the city of Newark, if we can get mayoral control or much more mayoral influence over the process, um, that we can create systems that will preserve our reforms and educate the electorate such that they'll make more wise decisions uh, for who's the next mayor. Good evening, my name is Freda, I'm a senior fellow. 
Um, and I have a question. Um, there's so many strategies and innovations, and you have these clock builders, as you put them, um, and they are in the process of putting things together that's working. How long, I'd like to get your, both of your thoughts about how long do you think it's going to take for strategies and systems to get into place, and are we as an, a nation going to slow down long enough to let these strategies take some effect before it's another strategy on the table and we're throwing out something that we said, well, we thought this was going to work, and now that's not going to work, and so let's try to do this and see how long that works. Great uh, I hope that, and I've been attacked for this, I hope that No Child Left Behind uh, is reauthorized. Uh, I think that, uh, I know that's a radical thing to say. I love it, but uh, <laughs> uh, I don't believe that you can run a school system without some sort of accountability. Uh, and I think that people have been beating up on that law which, without trying to figure out ways and make it, to make it work. Because I do think there's something to be said for making sure that everybody in the school system meets standards, okay? And that's a very important thing. And I, I've also been criticized for talking about national standards. I think everybody, if you go to school, I went to school in Montgomery, Alabama, and I can assure you that we had no idea what people were doing in New York City, <laughs> okay? So, but I think you, we should. And I think we should be getting the same amount of education and at the same time. So that's the only way you can do that is to have some sort of national standards. And No Child Left Behind is really very, very uh, weak in terms of what it does because it allows the state to make all of these decisions, not the federal government. So I mean, I hope it's re reauthorized, but I can understand why some politicians want to beat up on it. And I just want to answer that because I actually have some some thoughts as well. Um, first of all, I, first of all, I'm very sympathetic to teachers and, and friends of mine who are like, you know, this month it's this flavor comes in and then it's held on to for a year or two, then the new flavor comes in, and and, and you see this tiresome. Uh, uh, and to me, that's not necessarily whatever it's whether it's around a curriculum model, whether what it have you. That's not the kind of root of the reform that I think we really need to go to. It goes a lot deeper, uh, more sustainable, I think, than. Uh, some of the changes that people often see that come in, uh, whole school reform, or whatever, whatever we're looking at. Uh, I just the new child left behind. I saw some people gasping. I saw some people going to pull out their hair. I got nothing left to pull out. Um, uh, but look, I, I, the reality is, is, is just remember how this whole thing started. It was Ted Kennedy was one of the main drivers of this on, on, on the right, and it may have a lot of flawed portions, and I can go through it. Uh, but the ultimate idea of creating standards and accountability can't be thrown out when we go to reform this bill and this legislation. So I, I understand that there's some challenges. It was, you know, an un, you know, they authorized money, but they never sort of put it into the, into the, into the bill itself, which is very problematic to me. Uh, the ways that you, that some of the measures that they use uh, are flawed, in my opinion. So there's a lot of things we need to do to change it. But the idea that people are going to be held accountable for results, uh, I fully support. And I'll give you one example in, in school reform in Florida. Oh, and, and by the way, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, I'll stick with Florida. I won't get myself in trouble by going, by going to Milwaukee. Um, but school reform in Florida, like, I disagree. They passed a voucher law that I disagreed with. It was all based on testing. And it was said that each school would be tested and they would be graded. And schools that get F two years in a row, all the kids got vouchers and go wherever they wanted. Now, it's not the way I would want to uh, do a program. But something really interesting happened as soon as you created accountability. Suddenly, in those schools that got F's first year, and there were five of them, radical things were going on in the schools. Principals were coming in, administrators were coming in, holding after school classes, Saturday school classes. There was this urgency, or use a quote of the day, a fierce urgency of now uh, going on in the schools because people were so afraid of, uh, of, of, uh, of what would happen if they got that second F. Well, where the heck is that urgency? That urgency is not going to come unless there's some level of accountability. So that's a flawed system. And I, I don't necessarily endorse what happened in Florida, but I endorse that people need to be held to the fire. And, and we have systems I'm sorry, I have problems with. I have problems with that teachers don't have real incentives. You know, we renegotiated a union contract and created an incentive program for one of our unions and created incentive pay in a, in a public uh, employee union in the city of Newark. We should be doing that. The way tenure is approved right now, after two years of teaching, I'm sorry, I have a problem with that. If the system is not rigorous enough, uh, and that we should look at a way, different ways of doing the system and creating better accountability for producing results. If people are giving the resource, and this is what I say with my police department, push down accountability, but also give people the resources, the training, and the support they need, and then hold them accountable for the results that they produce. 
Hi, my name's Fatima Shama, and I'm a grad student here. Um, I want to take this conversation a little broader. Tonight's uh, title of tonight's uh, presentation is Achieving School Reform. So let's think about achieving educational reform. We have an election year, and our candidates are not talking about education. Um, we know the status of, um, of our educational system. How do we raise the level of conversation about education to make sure that our children and our school systems can compete in the 21st century and hold our elected officials to that, in, especially in the presidential race? Uh, I, uh, Bill, Bill Gates gave a lot of money to, to do this. It's something called Education 08 or something like that. Uh, nothing happened, uh, but the money is there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think that, uh, especially on the Democrat side, I think that they, they are so afraid of the teachers' unions that they're not going to say anything uh, radical because they want to get the support of the teachers' union. And of course, I'm not so sure what John McCain is going to say. I don't know if he's going to say anything about schools. Uh, and he has a 50% chance of being the president. Uh, so I, I don't really know. Uh, why people don't see this as a very, uh, as a crisis. When the country of Finland makes better grades in math and reading and in, in, in science than, than, than the United States, something is wrong. I, I've been to Finland. It's, <laughs> uh, uh, it's not that great. I mean, and, and they are just, they are, they, their kids are performing much better than our children. And I don't understand, I mean whites and blacks. So I'm trying to figure out what is going on that we have uh, sustained this kind of mediocrity uh, that we can't beat Finland, you know. So, so in a sense, when you, when you, as the economy becomes much more globalized and uh, we have to compete with all these countries around the world, we have to turn out better people. We just simply cannot afford to allow all these people not to be able to perform. So that's what I'm concerned about as the, you know, your generation will see much more globalization than my generation. So, I mean, you gotta compete with people that I didn't have to compete with. You may have to compete with people in India. I never had to do that. So now you, you have to think about how can I improve the school so that my kids can go one-on-one -on -one with a guy from Mumbai, or it used to be, uh, what is it, New Mumbai, Delhi or something, yeah. Not Mumbai. Now it's Mumbai. Um, so just real quick, look, uh, both Hillary and, and Barack have long sections on their websites about education. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not radical, it's not uh, lots of reform, it's very incremental. But at the end of the day, uh, Title I funding is small. Change on an education is local level change. And if the right leadership, in my opinion, on the local levels is gonna make the powerful difference. And Arne Duncan in Chicago is making a difference uh, in, in, in schools, more so, frankly, uh, than the next president of the United States, in my opinion, will make for Chicago students. Uh, uh, you know, and Joel Klein uh, is gonna have more of a direct impact on what happens in these schools. So it's very important what they say. My expectation state is ain't so high for uh, uh, them to make. And then again, if they put themselves out there, is this is something I'm responsible for, this is something we're gonna do, and have a sort of a big, hairy, audacious goal like Kennedy uh, did and said, we're gonna go to the moon uh, in, in, in you know, 10 years, as I wish somebody would stand up in this country and say that we're gonna educate all children at an equal and high level by in 10 years. I would love that, I would stand up, I'd probably you know, uh, go follow that person uh, in, into battle. But uh, it's, a, it's a really a local issue, and I'm, I want more local leaders to stand up and say it, but there's very few people in any city in America who can name members of their school board. Uh, most people, though, can name who their mayor is. And I think that's where the, uh, the authority should lie. And frankly, I think that that's where uh, uh, we should hold, that's a person we should hold accountable for ultimately results. Judge them, as I told my residents, judge me on what the murder rate is or the, or the shooting rate is. Judge them on real measurable outcomes for our children. And you'll probably get a lot results a lot quicker. One question that often is raised about mayoral control but hasn't come up tonight is the idea that it's true most citizens know who their mayor is but when they go to vote for the mayor they're voting on multiple issues not just education so um, this last time when mayor bloomberg was re-elected i asked my students almost all of them are education students what are the issues they're voting on most of them weren't necessarily voting on education at the time the west side stadium was a really big political thing that had just sort of fallen apart and people were voting on other issues so um, how do you account for that in the question of democratic governance and holding someone accountable if when they're up for re-election, maybe it's crime people are voting on and not education? 
Yeah, look, we polled in my in my poll, and you know, 80, 90 percent of the people um, said that, uh, that that crime was their number one issue. Also, very interestingly, most people thought that the mayor had responsibility of the schools in my city anyway, which is kind of interesting because I don't have the power, but, but, but a significant number of people at least thought that uh, I was the one, or the mayor was the one responsible for doing something about it. And again, it, at the end of the day, we as voters have to decide what's important to us and what issues we're gonna vote on. And, and we're voting on an individual that we hope can bring results and can be a change agent when change is necessary or a sustainer when we wanna sustain the results that we have. Um, it's much better to have a central figure you can hold accountable. And by the way, when you're in office, I may not have run on snow removal and nobody cared about it, but when the snow doesn't get picked up, uh, people are up in my face, uh, knocking on my door, getting me out of bed. So uh, that, that's the reality, and that's the way it should be. So again, having a centralized uh, figure, and, and Newark used to be run on a commission form of government where we had a city council that, that, that shared the power and each person had a different department they oversaw, et cetera, et cetera, but they realized that, that was untenable. It was too big of a, of a budget. Now interestingly, the budget of the city of Newark's school system is bigger than the entire budget of the city of Newark. Uh, and that's how much money is going into that institution. So we are, we said it wasn't good for a commission to form, to run the city of Newark because of the complexities of it. Well, you know what, in my opinion, on a bigger budget and a ma more massive scale, uh, the same kind of commission form of government is not gonna work uh, uh, in our schools either. I would add that uh, uh, in some cities, uh, uh, the school board hires more people than corporations, uh, and they hire more educated people in the corporations. Uh, so what you're talking about here is an enormous amount of money. And uh, one time I was on a radio station in, in Chicago, I mean New York, uh, in which I was talking about the school budget, and they kept asking me, why can't we increase the school budget? The problem is, it's, it's a secret, but School boards don't know how to spend money, okay? Uh, in fact, uh, Detroit has, has a, uh, had a big bond issue, and they couldn't spend the money. So the question becomes a, a matter of capacity. You know, uh, you know it, 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 it's amazing how much money, say, some school districts uh, spend on students, but when you go into the buildings, it's, uh, Mayor Booker has said, you see these, uh, you know, falling uh, ceilings and dirty hallways and broken lockers. You wonder, where's the money going? The fact is that some of these people who are supposed to be on the school board don't know how to spend the money. And, you know, I'm sorry, Professor, but, um, you know, when we had an appointed school board when we had the takeover in 95, they made appointments to the school board, and there were college professors on there, uh, people who had education backgrounds, uh, people who knew about budgets and finance. Um, and then as soon as it became an elected advisory board, which we have right now, all those people said, I ain't going through an election uh, in, the city, in, the, in the city of New York, going through the electoral process like it is. And suddenly you had, a, uh, you know, again, there's some very talented people on our school board, but you had a very different set of people lining up to run uh, for these offices, and a lot of that talent that we had on the school board and those different diverse skill sets uh, got drained away. So it's, to me, it's, it's just very clear. If, if we really want the kind of specialty skills that understand curriculum, that understand uh, uh, finance, that understand bond markets and things like that, that are critical uh, for being successful in running a billion dollar in Newark or a billion dollar uh, business, uh, then, then you really have to have, again, a centralized appointing authority or a centralized uh, uh, single individual in charge. Well, at this point, both our esteemed speakers have to get on airplanes. So we're going to give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much.